we're going to begin. Good morning, or I should say it's morning for uh, the presenters and for me uh, out on the West Coast. So good morning to you all. Um, welcome to the Open Education Network Summit and thank you for joining us for today's session, Building a Thriving Open Education Ecosystem. I am Sarah Cohen, the Senior Managing Director at the OEN. I use the she, her pronouns, and we are so delighted that you're joining us today. If you are not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. And you can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OEN. I am putting that into the chat right now. Here we go. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land, seated in the treatises of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you are so inclined. Uh, I'm joined today by Barb Thies, the OEN Community Manager. And she is going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A today. As we begin this session, I would like to share a few important details with you. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. And for that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. You can subscribe to the playlist uh, by clicking on the link I just put in the chat. Uh, the last 10 minutes-ish of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will not have a chance to ask all the questions to the presenters, but we will do our best. The chat is a space to share additional comments or reactions. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all of our attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. I am also putting that link into the chat now. The hashtag for the summit on Twitter is OEN Summit 21, again, coming into the chat. And you can follow us on Twitter at OpenEd underscore network. Again, in the chat. And now, please join me in welcoming today's presenters. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rajiv Jangiani, who is the Associate Vice President Teaching and of Teaching and Learning at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia. He is the architect of Canada's first zero textbook cost degree program. Rajiv's scholarship focuses on open educational practices, student-centered pedagogies, and ethical approaches to educational technology. A recipient of the Award for Excellence in Open Education from BC Campus and the Emerging Leader Award from Open Education Global, Rajiv's books include Open, the Philosophy and Practices that are Revolutionizing Education and Science, published in 2017, and Open at the Margins, Critical Perspectives on Open Education, published in 2020. Together with Dr. Robin DeRosa, he is the co-founder of the Open Pedagogy Notebook. We are also joined by Aruj Nizami, she is the Open Education Strategist at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. 
where she supports and facilitates open education initiatives by providing expertise through consultations, technical training, and strategic planning. She oversees the Zero Textbook Cost Program, provides support to OER grantees, Open Pedagogy Fellows, and Open Education Research Fellows. Uh, pardon me, Aruj co-facilitates the use of KPU's Open Publishing Suite, other known, otherwise known as OPUS. She also sits on the OEN's steering committee. She is a trained librarian with a degree from McGill University School of Information Studies. Rajiv and Aruj, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you so much, Barb, Sarah, and everyone at OEN. Good morning from us on the West Coast. So today we're gonna to be talking about building a thriving open education ecosystem at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia, Canada. But first we want to acknowledge that Kwantlen Polytechnic University is located on the traditional, ancestral and unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples. This includes the territories of the Kwantlen First Nations who bestowed their name on this university. We thank all First Nations for sharing their land and resources with us in friendship and in peace. And seeing that land acknowledgements are becoming more common, I wanna highlight that they don't always go far enough and that it's very important that we dive a bit deeper, inform ourselves, particularly around calls from indigenous communities like those um, like Land Back. So if you're interested, hashtag Land Back on different social media sites will sort of um, bring you into some conversations. And this means that, you know, there's opportunity for deep reflection, confronting possible discomforts and uneasiness. And I want to underscore that here in BC, many of the lands that we work on are unseated, that First Nations people never ceded or legally signed away their lands to the Crown or to Canada. So we frame our thinking about the holistic approach to open education at KPU around the idea of an ecosystem. And we've been framing various elements that constitute this ecosystem. When, when doing this, we you know, realize it's apparent that it's very challenging to give a linear presentation on something that is by its very nature, not linear. And in fact, the very strength of our ecosystem is that it's complex and multifaceted. Nevertheless, for clarity's sake, we're going to try and break things down, starting with the elements of our ecosystem, then move to the components that make up each element, our three pillars in open education at KPU. We'll focus in on the programs to highlight some of the converging elements of our ecosystem. We'll spend a bit of time spotlighting people and policies, and hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end for your questions. Ecosystems are understood to be complex environments with biological systems functioning in demarcated physical spaces. We find this metaphor really apt because it points to the ways ecosystems are sustaining and sustainable, made up of many parts that rely on each other to maintain a delicate balance while responding, adapting, and changing as time passes. The open education ecosystem at KPU is grounded in interdependent interactions across dedicated community of stakeholders and practitioners. This community works to mutually reinforce expertise by supporting grassroots open educational practices, fostering impactful mentoring relations, and encouraging regeneration as yesterday's mentors grow into mentoring new cohorts of practitioners. These processes, which are supported through rich programming, are also undergirded by strong administrative supports and policies. Together, this system is aimed at steady growth, thoughtful planning, and sustainable open and a sustainable open education ecosystem. So here is my visual attempt at not representing our ecosystem linearly. At KPU, open is made up of four core elements: people pillars, programs, and policies. It's really important to highlight that while I'm representing these in distinct parts, they're more than the sum of their parts. These four components overlap, they reinforce one another, and it is in those interactions of these components that their respective elements, um, you know, 
that is, that is how we can say we're building a thriving ecosystem in their interaction. So within each of these elements, there are several components. We're not gonna go in depth into every single component per se, but instead highlight the convergences and a word Rajiv often uses, which I've come to love, synergies of the several various parts. We delve into several components in detail, but can't attempt a comprehensive inventory of every component. Rather, we're gonna highlight some of the ways um, these point towards what we feel is at the core of this rich and functioning ecosystem, the interactions, the cooperation, the combined efforts of these various parts. So to get a sense of our strategic goals, Rajiv will speak to our three pillars. Thank you, Ruj. I feel somewhat uh, dismayed that I have to stop listening, especially since you've been so thoughtful and articulate in, in the opening. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just want to talk a little bit about, about the pillars over here in part, because I think in different places you might want to organize these differently, but this is how we've ended up uh, sort of thinking about uh, some of the different uh, parts of, of the system. Um, I know many of us in OpenEd began our work primarily in one of these domains uh, in supporting OER and perhaps textbook affordability with the workshops and, and growing those adoptions over time. But I think from, from our perspective, one of, the, one of the real lessons over the past decade or more um, has been really acknowledging and, and supporting the idea that people come to this work, come to this space, come to these realizations from different places, from different strengths. Uh, and some are very much in it for um, affordability, social justice, equity, uh, and that's wonderful, of course. Um, but others, are, 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 are certainly who are equally welcome into this space, uh, are those for whom it's really about pedagogical innovation. And, and it's often the case that uh, the cost savings to students is the secondary benefit in their view. And still others are more focused on evidence-based practice when it comes to teaching and learning and making sure that they're interrogating what they're doing in the classroom as they're designing these creative interventions, whether it's around open pedagogy or, or open educational resources. And so for us, these are certainly uh, elements that have synergies. In some ways, they're almost symbiotic. And I think we'll, we'll sort of look at how that plays out in, in some of these examples. But certainly our work in OER supports and reinforces our work in open pedagogy. And we're always looking to um, assess, evaluate, track, and, and demonstrate the impact of the work of both of those through open education research. Uh, and so I look, I like to think of these as these of these pillars as mutually reinforcing in a way. It certainly holds up uh, what is what is in, intended to be a rather big tent uh, at the institution. So back to you, Rich. So there are three programs that we'll be discussing. And again, we're zooming into these three to discuss the ecological processes at work that sustain the programs and all of the other component parts of our open work. Okay. Grant programs that incentivize the adoption, adaptation, and creation of OER are commonplace at many institutions. And at KPU, the strength of our grant program lies in the various ways that it intersects with the other elements of our ecosystem, as Rajiv just mentioned. So grant proposal, proposals are adjudicated by our Open Education Working Group, which in and of itself is made up of key stakeholders from across our university community. Applications must be endorsed by the Dean of a department, which we found a really, um, a really great way to recognize faculty who undertake these OER creation projects within their departments, but also within their peer and professional communities. Funding for our grant program comes from senior administration at KPU, from the provincial level through BC Campus, an organization in BC that supports open education and other initiatives at post-secondary institutions, but also has come from the Kwantlen Student Association, which has helped fund adoption grants. In recent years, OER grant recipients have embraced open pedagogy. So grants have um, been funded to undergo open pedagogy projects towards the creation of renewable student-created faculty facilitated OER. But that's not the only way in which students are involved in the OER grant process. Oftentimes, grant recipients use their project fund to hire students for various tasks. This could mean to work within Pressbooks, which is a software to create web-ready books, or to create H5P 
self-assessment activities. Speaking of Pressbooks, the grant program would not be possible without library support, specifically the Open Publishing Suite or OPUS. OPUS is managed by our systems librarian, Caroline Daniels, and our scholarly communications librarian, Karen Mayer-Klein. OPUS is the service point for all open publishing needs in, at our institution. Librarians are also key in generating faculty professional development competencies by holding workshops on numerous topics, such as press books, finding OER, copyright and creative commons licensing. Applying for our OER grants are some of the first ways that faculty encounter open education at KPU, but it's certainly not the last. Many of our grant recipients have gone on to take on other roles within this ecosystem, including the Teaching Fellow in Open Education, Open Pedagogy Fellow, Open Education Research Fellow. And last but not least, the bookstore has also been invaluable in this process by working with us to set up a print on demand service for OER. So when students prefer to have a hard copy of an OER, they can work with our bookstore and us to make that happen. So as Sarah mentioned, Rajiv is the architect of Canada's first ZTC program, which is an extensive set of courses and full credentials, both certificates and full degrees that do not require students to purchase a commercial textbook towards credit and credentialization. So we're up to 850 ZTC courses that are offered at KBU per academic year. And because of administrative collaboration across departments, faculties, students are able to search the course timetable and registration system for ZTC courses. Now, I will say that I'm the person who coordinates this effort across various departments, and it's incredibly daunting, but has become one of the most rewarding parts of my jobs because I get to see how deeply open education has become institutionalized across various departments at our institution. So it's incredible to work so laterally across the institution, connecting with faculty members from across the university and creating opportunities to share how to become an open education practitioner. To highlight the breadth of stakeholders that work together to ensure students can search the course timetable by ZTC attribute, I'm gonna walk through the ZTC process. So we've tried to establish ZTC data gathering as a season. To do this, we send out messaging to deans and across various communication channels to get instructors to provide information if their course qualifies as a zero textbook cost course. So by now faculty know that they're going to be contacted three times per academic year to provide this information and the deans have been an amazing resource in encouraging instructors to participate in this process and to feel, you know, part of this, um, this process. We also have a relationship with the Office of the Registrar, which has given us permissions within our enterprise resource planning system to be able to communicate with faculty and to have a clear sense of what they're teaching. So through Banner, I'm able to harvest course information, including faculty names, email addresses, um, course and section. And I use these spreadsheets to send a mail merge to each instructor each semester. The email invitations that go out to faculty um, are there, they ask faculty to respond through a web form, a very short web form. Um, and this also helps us understand how their, their course falls under the ZTC program. Is it because they're using OER? Is it because they're using library licensed materials? KPU's open, um, open student assistants use the results and we together liaise with faculties as well as scheduling to get that attribute into the course registration timetable. So that goes to show just how many different points and people we have to interact with to get this done. But that also means that all of these people know exactly what's going on with ZTC, but beyond that, they know about open education. The, the course attribute is great for students, but it also highlights another key relationship between open and the office of planning and accountability. So the ZTC attribute allows us to evaluate student enrollment, persistence, performance in ZTC and non-ZTC courses. 
And this in turn helps fuel excitement for ZTC, for the ZTC program because we're able to share that consistently across the university, students enrolled in ZTC courses perform better than those in non-ZTC courses. And finally, that email that I sent each instructor each semester acts like a calling card. So after that initial email invitation is sent out, each semester I receive emails about, you know, what is open ed? Can we book a consultation? We'd really like to make our, our courses more affordable for students. We'd like to learn more about open pedagogy and we wanna evaluate what we do in our courses towards open education research. I'm gonna pass it on to Rajiv to speak about our Open Pedagogy Fellowship. Thanks, Rajiv. And, and, and I think over here in talking about the Open Pedagogy work, I mean, I think this is the exemplar um, project or initiative within our work in Open Pedagogy, but certainly we offer uh, in partnership with uh, the, the rest of the Teaching and Learning Commons, uh, a fair bit of training to faculty who, uh, if they're interested in, in embracing elements of Open Pedagogy, so sort of introduction to Open Pedagogy workshops or more tool specific focused things, uh, whether it's, you know, WordPress or H5P or those kinds of things. Uh, but a few years ago, uh, we, uh, I had the good fortune of uh, attending a presentation at uh, the Open Ed Conference by uh, 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 Mike Mill and uh, Shinta Hernandez from Montgomery College, uh, which is a wonderful community college uh, in Maryland. Um, and they were talking about this fellowship that they had pioneered, which was really about um, faculty working with their students. Uh, well, first of all, faculty designed a set of renewable assignments. And those of you who are familiar with that term, you'll know that that's a, a very common approach to open pedagogy, uh, where students as part of their coursework are often creating uh, open educational resources. But in this particular case, uh, OER that are specifically uh, designed to serve progress towards a specific sustainable development goal from the United Nations. Uh, and it was a wonderful way I thought to, to re really draw on uh, obviously open licensing on the one hand and critical pedagogy on the other in terms of connecting this work uh, to the you know broadest uh, and most um, serious challenges of our time where they were talking about food insecurity uh, or gender inequality or, or things like that. And so we immediately approached them and, and from the second year of their initiative, we've been partnering with them. So this is our third year now doing this and it's been growing every year since then. We have folks in the Maricopa Community College system who joined us last year and this year there's a number of other institutions in British Columbia and, and elsewhere that have joined this fellowship. But uh, this is now not just international and, and multi-institutional, but it's by design multidisciplinary. So faculty are put into to groups of typically two to three um, in which they are all from different disciplines, uh, taking advantage of that wonderful cross-pollination where you know, what is normative practice in one discipline is often really foreign and amazing in another. Um, and they design collaboratively renewable assignments. The commonality is not their discipline, it's a specific SDG or SDGs that they're focusing on. And so this has been a wonderful way for faculty to really embrace open pedagogy in a way that OER creation is the byproduct, authentic learning is ultimately the goal, deeper learning is the goal. Uh, and it's been a wonderful, I think, complement to, to the rest of, of, of what we're doing. We have through the OER grant program, open pedagogy projects that are funded anyway, but these projects are specifically designed uh, to be, to be uh, conducted in partnership with, with obviously colleagues at the other institutions but also connecting to these, these broad challenges facing humanity. So uh, it's been a wonderful initiative. I know it won the fellowship itself um, and Montgomery College won an award from the Open Ed Global Organization uh, for their work over the last couple of years. Uh, and I have to say, it's to me just another example of how, uh, you know, uh, the real innovation often in teaching and learning, the expertise comes honestly from the community college uh, space, uh, even though they often don't get the headlines in the Chronicle and, and our portals like that. So a real hat tip to, to Mike and Shinta and, and their colleagues at Edmund Comrie. Uh, we're really grateful that they allowed us to partner with them. Uh, but again, from our perspective, this is the sort of showpiece when it comes to open pedagogy. The fellowship also involves a student showcase, of course, and there's a beautiful guide uh, that has been in development and that we'll be able to share with you as well if you're interested in learning more about how this fellowship uh, operates and, and what, for example, past examples of uh, these assignments have looked like, because the renewable assignments that the faculty design are, of course, openly licensed as well. Um, and along the way, the last thing I'll say over here 
is that um, a number of lessons have been learned along the way. Uh, I think those of you who have heard me talk about open pedagogy in the past will know that uh, we certainly believe that agency for students is a critical component of, of open pedagogy. And for example, not mandating that students perform public scholarship without any consideration, for example, for uh, their own choice uh, when it comes to what they want to do with their intellectual property, or certainly navigating the risks uh, of performing public scholarship, particularly for, for students from marginalized backgrounds. And so, for example, some of the tools we've developed along the way we'll share with you as well, is we worked with our legal team at KPU uh, to develop a, a, a template wherein students can choose which specific open license they are they're interested in applying to their intellectual property. Uh, it's a nice explainer and it's an easy form. And of course, we've openly licensed that as well. So please do feel free to take advantage and build on, on our efforts over there. Uh, thank you, Aruj. Uh, Uruj mentioned the students uh, in the program uh, and they, they work with us in many ways. And of course, uh, uh, Uruj talked about the, the many students who are hired as assistants on various OER grant funded projects. Uh, but we have three other students who've been really, really key members of our team now for a few years. Um, uh, Lana Radomsky has been working closely with me for a long time now. Uh, for, she's graduated actually from KPU at this point. But uh, whether it comes to um, you know, data gathering and analysis for our ZTC program to make sure that when we're talking about hundreds of uh, courses every semester that we're not making too many errors and we're, we're passing information on to the registrar's office accurately, uh, or whether it's uh, you know, hosting booths and, and orientation events uh, and sharing information with students about the availability of ZTC courses, Lana has been a really critical player for us um, as well with her technical skills with Pressbooks. Uh, Manmeet as well has moved into similar roles, has been with us for a couple of years, and Monica Lay as well, um, she's actually a student in our graphic design and marketing program, and so we were proud to, to hire her with the assistance of a, a grant from uh, BC Campus, our local champions in, in this province, uh, to support our, our publishing program. So when it comes to books that we're publishing through the grant funded program, uh, Monica is involved in in terms of the layout and dealing with some of the graphic pieces in the production process in the Opus Suite, uh, which is wonderful to see that, that um, yes, I'm gonna use that word again, synergy when it comes to the training for students and where we want, uh, where, where we want this to go. Um, and then beyond the students, of course, we have the core of our working group. Uh, Uruj mentioned that this is a cross-functional group. Uh, this has been where the magic has been happening for, for the last five years or so uh, since we founded this. Uh, and so uh, aside from Uruj and myself, who you're seeing on, on the left-hand side of the screen, although I think there's a word associate that's missing, I've been accidentally promoted over there. Um, we have a dean, uh, and of course the deans have terms, so they rotate, which is nice because they all get exposure to this for, for a few years. Um, so certainly there's, there's representation from, from senior leadership, there's student representation uh, from the association, um, there is representation on the bottom right uh, from our bookstore in the form of our bookstore manager, which sends a really important message, uh, certainly in terms of our partnerships with that unit for print on demand, but even otherwise. Um, uh, where the mouse cursor is right now at teaching and learning with technology strategists, that's one of our staff in the teaching and learning commons, uh, certainly when it comes to most of these projects often have some element of ed tech, and so having that lens has been quite, quite useful for us. And then, of course, the core, which, uh, in terms of the input, really important to have faculty input. So we have faculty from different big F faculties uh, who are represented, as well as librarians. And of course, two of the librarians are faculty as well. Uh, but the third uh, representative from the library is, in fact, our university librarian uh, himself. Um, and then, of course, our Open Education Research Fellow has been another, uh, another a new addition, as we have um, uh, every year now, in addition to our Open Education Research Institute, which is a sort of a, a multi-day training institute for, for those interested in building capacity around open education, we also support uh, an individual researcher to, to really advance their work uh, every given year. And so they are de facto or ex officio, I should say, uh, a member of the Open Ed Working Group as well. So that's the core. Uh, and it's been working really well from our perspective. We work nimbly, synchronously, asynchronously as needed. We typically only meet in person, as it were, once a semester. Uh, but it's really been the group that has been uh, uh, provided the key feedback in terms of the development of our strategic plans in open education. Um, and, uh, and of course, talking about strategic plans, I'll note also that while we have a strategic plan in open education itself, and I'll try to provide the link in the chat uh, for you for that, 
that dovetails very well with the institution's broader strategic planning. So for example, our institution has an academic plan that has a set of nine goals. And one of those goals is very squarely centered on open education. And I recognize that this is a rarity. It puts us in a place of privilege that certainly senior administration, you know, the board of governors, Senate, all of the stakeholders have agreed to this. They have really focused on this. Uh, and so it allows us to do a lot more than, than I think is possible in some other contexts. And uh, this is just illustrating one of the strategies under that goal is we're certainly, certainly uh, working towards supporting the adoption of OER across all of our faculties and schools uh, in a variety of ways, right? Education, training and support, system and role rec uh, integration, and of course, recognition as well. But beyond that, uh, I mean, the academic plan, this particular goal talks about uh, the growth of more ZTC programs. At this point, we have eight and we continue to grow them. Uh, I should add that our, our, our longest ZTC program, we have, uh, we have a couple of bachelor's level degrees where the entire four-year program can be completed with zero textbook costs, but many other things. Uh, there's about, uh, it talks about training and support for open pedagogies in particular, uh, and, and as well, institutional policies. Um, and so going from there, um, uh, I, I can uh, go immediately to the policy question. And, I, and I'll say for us, policy is a very interesting thing. And I, and I think almost deliberately, we're talking about policy at the tail end of our presentation over here, because I think from, from, our, from my perspective and certainly from our experience, the ideal policies are those that effectively codify what is existing practice, as opposed to trying to engineer somehow culture change by, by forcing a, a top-down policy in there. And so we do have a number of policies, some are sort of big P policies and some are more sort of little P policies, if you will. This is a more of a big P policy, our intellectual property policy. Um, and I don't know if we have, no, we don't have the language of this on the screen over here, uh, but effectively it promotes all three things. It, it promotes the adoption, uh, the creation, adaptation and adoption of OER is one of the things it encourages. Uh, it encourages publication and open access outlets, of course, uh, including you know, the use of our open access repository for preprints for our scholars, for example. And then the third prong is that it, it uh, encourages the adoption of open science practices. And so you know, we're looking at, again, broader open practices over here. So whether you're talking about pre-registration of hypotheses or sharing data on open repositories, those sorts of open science practices. Uh, again, it's encouraging, it doesn't mandate, but it certainly supports and encourages those who want to engage in this work because this is effectively what, what we're signaling as an institution we want to do. And it's not just because we're a, an open access institution in terms of an, uh, a more of an open admissions policy. Uh, it certainly is increasingly a way in which we're trying to weave openness into the DNA of the institution. So um, it certainly, uh, it should be at this point, uh, uh, effectively, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, succession proof, if you will. So it's not contingent on a particular individual anymore, this work, it's, it's just part of the institution. Um, the other policy I'll highlight is, is a small p policy, which is something that I was enormously excited about uh, uh, several years ago when we managed to get this done, uh, is, and, but this is in the weeds, I admit. Uh, so our Senate Standing Committee on Curriculum and then Senate after that, uh, after due consideration, uh, passed the motion that, we, that I advanced, which had to do with this, any course that is developed at the institution, any new course, uh, but also any course that comes up for revision, which is the case every five years, you know, if, if, if a course is not being uh, uh, revised midway through for some other reason, um, every course has to undergo a search for relevant OER. Uh, now, this is not a mandate to adopt the OER, but what this was, was a serious nudge by the institution. You have to look, you have to make an educated choice. By all means, as a faculty member, you are the one who gets to make that call. You can decide whether, oh, it's not good enough. There's nothing available, that's fine. And the library will help you with that search. But the fact that we're able to nudge that. And so this is a, a screenshot of, of that sort of field in the course development template that, it, that shows you an example of our introduction to sociology course where they've consulted um, and of course they've listed uh, even though the individual faculty who might teach this course don't have to adopt it, this is ready for them to go with. It's been pre-screened. And so for us, this is one of those small ways in which this is how you sort of make it the default in many ways uh, by making it so that uh, it's not just incentive structures, but the systems and processes are, are very hospitable for this kind of work. So it's not just down to those who cared enough to go the extra mile. 
this is a part, this is a step that everybody has to go through effectively. And so for me, this meant as soon as we passed this, I knew, all right, in five years, every single course at the institution will have undergone this search without us having to beg and push and nudge and incentivize everything along the way. So a, a big, small policy, if you will. Um, right. I think that's over to you, Rich. In concluding this overview on our work and outlook at KPU, I want to reflect on the importance of digging into our understanding of structures and critiquing and deconstructing them, but also rebuilding and ultimately improving systems of care for our students. Open education practitioners and even our more reluctant colleagues. Joe Freeman, a feminist academic, wrote a very important essay that I keep returning to in, in my life about organizing structures in radical feminist collectives. Freeman says, once the movement no longer clings to, no longer clings tenaciously to the ideology of structurelessness, it is free to develop those forms of organization best suited to its healthy functioning. This does not mean that we should go to the other extreme and blindly imitate the traditional forms of organization. I think this is a really fitting place to end because it's very easy when talking about ecosystems and organic structures to invisibilize the work that goes into harnessing, connecting, and sustaining these initiatives. What we've discussed here aren't dis disparate pillars, programs, people, or policies. They are organized, facilitated, and based on relationships and community at our university and outside of our university. We're happy to take your questions. I see that there's there's one in the um, in the Q and A queue. Thank you so much, Aruj and Rajiv, for an excellent presentation. Um, yes, we do have a question in the Q and A concern, and the question is concerning the ZTC program. What tools do you use to discover quality OER for different courses? Is this a manual searching effort? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So I guess I'm going to return to, to one of those, those four components of our, our ecosystem, and that is the people, and specifically the library. So our librarians, specifically our Skullcom librarian, as well as our web systems librarian, host regular workshops on discovering open educational resources. But beyond that, they are also um, sort of the contact person to liaise with the liaison librarian, the subject specialist who we put faculty in touch with to do those deeper dives and those searches. Um, so we don't really take that stuff on just the two of us. We, you know, we're able to send folks to the experts who are able to get that information to them. Rajiv may want to add. Yeah, I mean, I think you. Uh, and nothing to add to, to, to your particular part of the answer, but I, I do want to, just because this will come up so often in all of our work, uh, it's, I think it's always useful um, in conversations with colleagues to interrogate the use of the term quality, uh, because I, I think there's many different understandings of that, right? I mean, you can think about it traditionally in terms of how do faculty perceive or review this in terms of, or subject matter experts in terms of its quality, quote unquote. Uh, and of course, BC Campus and the OEN both have, have rubrics to help evaluate that, of course. Uh, but I think it's easy in many cases to understand quality in our context, for example, as the ability to have uh, a much more localized, a much more up-to-date resource than one could ever hope to have, uh, right? In terms of uh, BC and Canada being a smaller market for textbooks, uh, for example, there's a good number of courses that effectively have no other option effect, uh, except to, to, to work with US editions of textbooks with statistics and, and, and examples that are not really relatable in many contexts. So for us, I think it's always useful from my perspective, to always flip the, the framing of what we mean by quality. Because if you're talking about a way to allow students to engage in authentic assessments, if you're allowing for more localization, a more up-to-date resource, uh, featuring work in, in labs in your department, um, uh, and certainly uh, not ignoring the affordability question, uh, I, I do think it, it's useful to toy with what we mean by quality. But, but I totally get your question. Thank you. We have another question coming in from the Q&A. On the course development policy, do you track how many adoptions have taken place due to the required search for OER? 
Also, do librarians conduct these searches and make the recommendations? Do they do that in partnership with the faculty member? Does this strain library resources or librarians' time? So a little bit, it sounds like a bit of a continuation of that uh, last question. That's a really amazing question because it points to something I forgot to mention. So not specifically due to the course development policy, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rajiv, but we do track our adoptions through that ZTC web form. And one of the components I left off was this constant communication we're in with BC Campus, our sort of umbrella organization in British Columbia that tracks province-wide adoptions. So we report ROER adoptions to them, and then they um, track it through through the through the province. Um, so I'm not I'm not certain if it's through the policy itself, but it certainly happens three times a year when we send out that ZTC form. Um, I'm trying to look at the other points of the questions. Librarians are a big part in conducting those searches. And in terms of in terms of time and strain, I'll let Raji speak to sort of the upper administration and the support that we have that that also exists within our, our library. Yeah and and it's a really good question, Jen. I mean, I, I would say in some ways, you know, that the policy language is again, one piece of this, especially when you're um, trying to create, um, you know, with the ecosystem metaphor, literally more fertile ground effectively. Um, this does not necessarily mean, of course, a policy itself doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to follow the policy to the T, uh, right? So it is challenging. And I would say we're not strictly tracking um, the, the 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 sort of impetus or the cause of the of the uh, adoption in the end. I mean, in part, that's sort of almost a practical thing because um, I think in most of our institutions, you'll notice that you know people will interact with you in in multiple ways and at multiple times before they finally sort of um, decide to make a decision. In many cases, so they might have attended some professional development workshops on open pedagogy, and they may have heard something from a colleague in their department who's sort of gushing about the impact of this work. And they may have also done this. And so it's hard to know what the sort of ideology of that decision is in, in many cases. Um, but I'll also say, you know, one of the things that's wonderful over here is our university librarian is incredibly supportive of this work. And so from his perspective, and, and, and you know, he's very happy for, for open to be uh, part of part of the work and approach of, of all of our librarians, not, not just people who are actively working to support our open publishing suite. Uh, and I think for us, there is that strength of the relationship for our liaison librarians with their departments, right? Where there's that trust, there's that relationship, you know them uh, and you know what their needs are. And, and so as much as possible over the, over the years, even before Uruj uh, got to us and, and enhanced almost everything we do, um, it, it's, um, I've always been trying to channel whether it comes to, oh, you know, new messages from the OEN or BC campus about, hey, new new textbooks this week, instead of me going to the faculty member to say, hey, um, you know, I'm going to send that to the layers on library and, and allow them to, to, to share that if they deem that uh, appropriate. So really working to strengthen that relationship. Um, and at this point, you know, we're not at the at the point of where people are overwhelmed. Um, I mean, I look forward to having that problem. <laughs> and I'll put it that way. Thank you. I really appreciate that distributive model um, and really thinking about how, how you can engage so many different people in that work, um, perhaps as a way to not overwhelm people. That sounds like um, that's a real important strategy for people to employ. We have another question. We get, the, we get questions like this often, so I look forward to hearing your answer. Regarding the Faculty Senate resolution to have new or revised courses search for OER, and kudos on that. That is what the question says. That's not personal editorializing. Can you tell us more about how that conversation played out uh, on the Senate? How did the faculty who opposed, or pardon me, what did the faculty who opposed this policy have to say? I'd also like to add on, I wonder how you overcame that opposition. Yeah, I mean, this, so I think some of this is, is maybe I can respond in a way that's partly helpful in terms of general context, but of course, part of this is necessarily specific to our context. Um, and every institution, I have to acknowledge, you always know this, you know, you have, I know in the OEN and, and also myself, we've worked with enough institutions that when you sort of work with a new institution, one of the first things you really need to do very quickly is understand where the politics are, where are the landmines, what's the history over here, um, and, and understand that context before you inadvertently, you know, blow, blow something up. Um, 
and and I would say, you know, there's a couple of elements of the policy that that allowed for this to go through more easily. Uh, one was that look, this is not being mandated, right? It's not being mandated. It's simply uh, a search. A faculty member needs to make that call, and that was an important distinction, right? I mean. Um, uh, the University of Maryland, University College took a different approach, for example, when they went very aggressively in the direction of OER, and that worked for their context, it wouldn't have worked for us to mandate the adoption of OER. Um, the other part, I think, is, is, is that this is not the only kind of uh, step along the uh, of consultation along the way of development. So typically, uh, it kind of builds on existing practice, which was a consultation with the library concerning um, resources and materials that might be needed when you're developing a new course, and what does the library need to, to, to gain access to in order to support this, this learning for students. And so really just sort of building on that a little bit in, in a specific direction, but leaving that agency and respecting the academic freedom of faculty made this a whole lot easier to sell, as it were. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's the reality of some of these kinds of politics, uh, which is, what would that speech look like exactly uh, at Senate if a faculty member really wanted to vehemently oppose this when they have the academic freedom not to adopt it, not to participate themselves? Um, are they going to argue against making affordable courses more visible to students um, or, or the option to, to avail of um, high quality OER if the course developer deems it so? So I, I would say, one of the useful things in this space is uh, when the work you're doing has such self-evidently noble goals uh, that have student success uh, and well-being at the core of them, it's sometimes really uncomfortable uh, to make, you know, um, make trouble. Uh, and that's not the worst thing, uh, as long as one does respect those core principles of, of academic freedom and the rest. So I would say there is definitely a political side to this. Uh, and it was, it's always good to approach a conversation with enough allies um, uh, already uh, ready to support you. Thank you. Uh, if uh, attendees, if anyone has another question, now is a good time to add it to either the chat or the Q&A feature. Rajiv, I'm going to take this opportunity actually to ask a question. Uh, to both you or Aruj, but I think it happened perhaps before Aruj joined you. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the, the strategies that you employed to bring administration with you. Um, so how you've built um, to this, you know, how you've laid that groundwork to get to a point where you have this complete ecosystem where you were able to um, appropriate your time away from um, the work that you were doing as, as a psychologist to bring a rouge to KPU. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you found to be effective in uh, making the case to administrators? You know, so this is where things are really different at KPU. And, and I'm sorry, I know this is going to create some envy, but uh, here in the chat, is a journal article uh, published in 2015 that was co-authored by our university president and our provost at the time, talking about the importance of using open educational practices to support institutional strategic excellence in teaching, learning, and scholarship. That's just an illustration of, of uh, to give, give you a sense, I didn't have to do any of this. Uh, they were very much, um, certainly our university president came from a background at uh, you know, open universities and Empire State, where they've been doing a lot of interesting things for a number of years uh, in the SUNY system. Um, and so it was really, I think, from our president's perspective, he was waiting for the right time to be able to advance some of this work at the institution. Um, and then it sort of piggybacked along the way. There was a small investment in, in my time to advance work as a teaching fellow with sort of time release from, from teaching to advance this work, partial time release. Uh, and then that really, really went well. And so they invested more and more and more. And then eventually the strategic planning for the institution allowed us with enough grassroots interest and momentum to ensure that, yes, we can actually now embed this in the institution's strategic plan because this is no longer a, a case of, of a top-down goal. Uh, this is now uh, sort of almost a marriage of, of uh, uh, top-down support and grassroots interest, which for us was exactly the sweet spot we wanted to be in. So it was a question of timing, 
but uh, I'm very, very lucky. I'm definitely going to acknowledge that in, in that I did not have to make the case as it were to senior admin. Uh, even though, yes, of course, new administrators come in all the time. And so when I had a new provost, I was like, day one, ah, oh, you know, we have a big KPU day. There's a panel with our OER grantees uh, speaking. Why don't, you, why don't you come with me? And so, yes, of course, I want to make sure that, that folks get acclimatized. Uh, but at this point, you know, between it being embedded in, in our planning and our policies and many of our practices, that's why I feel like it, it's been, now it's easily, easily recognized as part of the fabric of, of the institution. And certainly I will always leverage any positive publicity the institution gets as a result of it as well as needed. But, but no, I'm very fortunate um, at this point, you know, when new administrators come to KPU, they come in, of course, knowing that this is a part of what we do. Um, and, and so, so it's, 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 it's part of the attraction for them. Um, but yeah, I never really had that problem. Thank you so much. It also reminds me of what you were talking about earlier about building a succession proof uh, initiative. Um, so I, I appreciate you kind of, and I really appreciate that metaphor of the marriage between the top down and the grassroots, that that is really that sweet spot that, that you are able to find and that we're all looking for. I suppose that's why we're in the weeds so much. But yes. <laughs> we have another question. I think this is our last question. Maybe we'll see. Uh, KPU has developed a sustainable ecosystem that enables open education to thrive. What are your challenges, goals, and or next steps? Great question. Yeah, Rajiv was mentioning how, you know, there there are problems that we wish we did have, reaching capacity and things like that. And he also mentioned that, you know, this round of OER grants that we gave out have been the largest. So we just approved eight new projects. And I think one of our challenges now is being strategic about what we do fund and how we want to um, use our resources to the question about librarian resources. Because the library and those librarians are so key in our open publishing suite, we have to think about their time and resources as well. So a challenge here is, is about saying no or not now um, or not in this and not in the way that it looks perhaps you can join this other faculty member who's doing something similar. So really being strategic about what we do fund and what we do say yes to is becoming much more important. In terms of next steps, I'm sure um, Rajiv can speak a bit to the Open Ed Research Institute, which we didn't highlight in this presentation, but they were certainly members from other university um, departments that were key in making that happen as well. Yeah, thank you, Ruj. I just put a link to the Open Ed Research Institute uh, webpage in the chat for those interested. Um, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, when you start an OER grant program, it's often the case of, you know, you know, it's almost a, a you build it and you hope they will come effectively. Uh, and and over time, it, it's nice to now be in a position of where you're not just um, hoping and eager and willing to support any project that comes along, right, because you want to meet people where they are. Um, but now you're at the point of, you know, limited resources and having to make those strategic choices. So thinking about, you know, are we going to calibrate our OER grant program to, to, to sort of prioritize strategic areas and then have open calls for more sort of bespoke, uh, you know, unique but small enrollment courses? How are we going to approach that? Those are useful challenges that we're struggling with right now uh, as we're revising our plan for the future. Um, I do think you know a lot of this is around building that capacity, and part of it is um, really growing our faculty capacity over the years. You know, years ago I was facilitating all of our open pedagogy workshops, but then as our teaching fellows and as our um, uh, research fellows and other faculty, in fact, who, who've embraced open pedagogy, have got so much experience, they've eff effectively taken over, which is a lovely thing. Uh, and now more and more in different bigger faculties at different departments, having those local champions. So uh, one way of dealing with the resource constraints in terms of our end is, again, building that local capacity within departments and faculties. And that's something that's a very long road, of course, um, but certainly looking forward to, to that as, as a general um, challenge and, and, and goal for us. Um, and then I think more broadly, you know, we, we have, we're doing well, but we have, we have a long way to go. Um, you know, I think at this point, I, you know, when I look at a given semester, you know, you look at 
what are we at? Is it about you know twenty five percent now of all of our courses in a given semester that are at least ZT at least twenty five percent are ZTC? That's fantastic. There's a long way to go still, uh, and I think part of this is also getting at this through the through the pedagogy because it's still the case that um, you know there are various ed tech vendors who will prey on the precarity in higher education uh, by selling convenience and ease as the primary uh, reason for the adoption of their technologies as opposed to pedagogy. And, and so for, uh, for me, and particularly now that open education is part of teaching and learning more broadly, it's not, it used to be it's a separate department, but now it's integrated with all of our teaching and learning supports and strategies. And, and so for me, it's, it's really about um, foregrounding that, celebrating that and, and leveraging that to make sure that you know, we are an institution that cares primarily about teaching excellence. Um, and, you know, for a variety of reasons, not just in terms of data privacy and cost and, and the rest, uh, you know, having, you know, 60% of your students buy a, a $300 textbook and have to pay to do their homework online on a platform with automated grading without instructor intervention or feedback is not necessarily a, a model uh, that reflects excellence or authentic uh, assessment in pedagogy. And, and I do think that um, we're seeing increasingly, not just at the course level, but entire programs uh, are being redesigned to embrace elements of open pedagogy and OER. This just happened with our entrepreneurial leadership program. Uh, and so I, I think just these are the interesting challenges as, as you're sort of growing and setting goals. Uh, but I think just the other little piece I'll leave you with is, we are very cognizant that in many ways we are in a position of privilege given our institutional support um, and where we are with senior leadership and a strategic planning. And so, of course, one of the things I'm always thinking about uh, is what can we do that would be of service to the wider uh, movement, to other institutions, even if it's giving you a model or something you can point to or openly licensing our resources and materials that, and guides that we produce, but certainly trying to support the movement as a whole and, and and again, trying to just that that is that is I think a really really important um, element of of um, what we need to do in our position um, at KPU. I think. Thank you, thank you, Aruj and Rajiv, um, for today's presentation. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us, audience. Thank you for joining us. We wanna remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be shared in the coming weeks, including uh, the transcript and the chat because there were so many terrific links in the chat uh, that Aruj and Rajiv shared. So really looking forward to having that accompany um, the video. You can subscribe to our YouTube playlist to receive a notification when uh, we do post everything. And again, I am putting the link to that in the chat. Um, and please keep the conversation going by joining us on Slack at oensummit21.slack.com. Uh, I am putting that into the chat. And finally, if you are an OEN member, we hope that you will continue the conversation in the OEN community of practice. Rajiv and Aruj, thank you again and uh, continue to join us at another summit presentation this week. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.